Well, welcome, folks. This is Hank Paulson. I'm really delighted to have uh, today Dr. John Paul Taylor to present the fifth annual Carl Rennie Lewy Body Dementia Initiative Lectureship. Um, you know, the Carl Rennie Dementia Initiative began because his wife, Tamar Real, recognized that the diagnosis of Lewy Body was hard to make and that their family went through emotional turmoil as the diagnosis was a mystery for a number of years. So when he passed away with Lewy body dementia, uh, she committed uh, funds and her friends committed funds to enhancing awareness of this disease in the state of Michigan. And we've been able to do that over the last five years. And part of that has been having an annual lectureship of a leading expert in uh, dementia with Lewy body disease or some nucleinopathies in general. Now, we uh, know that so much about the COVID pandemic has been horrible. But one of the very small silver linings is our ability to bring a, a world leader in Lewy Body Dementia Initiative across the seas to visit us here in Ann Arbor today, Dr. John Paul Taylor, who is at the University of Newcastle. Uh, he is without question one of the top leaders in Lewy Body Dementia clinical and scientific uh, studies um, in, in the world. Uh, and I would say is really leading the the efforts to have better treatment and better diagnosis of uh, the synucleinopathies, particularly dementia with Lewy body disease. He is uh, a uh, professor at uh, Newcastle. He received his uh, PhD in neuroscience from Newcastle University, his MRC psych in psychiatry from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and then received a certificate of completion of training in geriatric psychiatry in 2010. He has been incredibly productive, uh, not incredibly, credibly productive. It's quite real. Uh, 180 uh, peer-reviewed publications and two books. Um, he uh, has received numerous grants for the work he's done uh, in uh, various aspects of Lewy body disease. Um, I would say he does mechanistic uh, studies of, of the key symptoms in Lewy body disease, including the basis of cognitive impairment, why there are cognitive fluctuations, why there are visual hallucinations. And all of this with a view to developing experimental medicine platforms to, to ameliorate these, uh, these difficult symptoms. Uh, he's been involved in uh, first uh, uh, trials that test electroceutical approaches to treating cognitive neuropsychiatric symptoms in LBD. And he has developed a very powerful uh, management toolkit uh, for Lewy body disease, which you'll hear about more today as well. Um, Dr. Taylor, it is a delight for us to have you here today. Uh, visiting us uh, as the fifth annual Carl Rennie Lewy Body Dementia Initiative. Uh, we may have uh, community members as well as healthcare professionals, as well as Alzheimer's disease staff in the audience, and we're delighted to have you here today. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you uh, for that amazing introduction, and it's uh, it's fantastic to be with uh, everyone, even if it's a sort of virtual uh, setting. And, you know, I hope uh, one day in the post-COVID world to be actually coming to see you all uh, for real. Um, so no, thank you again for, for having me. So uh, this is where I get technical and try and share my screen. So if you just give me a moment, you should be able to. Carol, maybe some help here. No, I'm okay. I'm just, uh, no okay. problems. Just getting the, okay. So I, I just check everybody can see that okay before I start. Yes, we can see it. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, I suppose the, the uh, title of my talk is Diamonds Are Forever. And this is an overview of the UK Diamond Louis uh, study. Uh, and I was uh, thinking of a sort of clever title to, to share with you guys. And I, I thought of the the movie Diamonds Are Forever, which had uh, Sean Connery as 007 in as, as James Bond. Unfortunately, as you, as you know, Sean Connery passed away quite recently with uh, with dementia. But I think that you know perhaps to I suppose what I feel is the importance of the Diamond Louis program. It is a it is a diamond. It is going to be of hopeful you know, value, and I think also potentially will have longevity uh, for. Uh, us and you know for uh, uh, patients and their families living with Lewy body dementia. 
So just uh, some brief disclosures. I, I, you know, I hasten to add that they don't have any bearing upon the, the uh, current uh, presentation. So before delving into the, the Diamond Louis uh, program, I thought I would just uh, sort of set the scene with uh, some of the nomenclature in regard to Louis body dementia and sort of say what I'm going to be talking about LBD includes both dementia with Louis bodies and also Parkinson's disease dementia. So Parkinson's disease dementia being that dementia which occurs after the establishment of, uh, of Parkinson's disease. And then dementia with Lewy bodies where the dementia either occurs before or concurrently with the Parkinsonism or certainly within one year of the onset of the motor symptoms. Now, I appreciate there's a little bit of a sort of false dichotomy here with regard to, you know, DOB and PDD. And certainly from a mechanistic and pathobiological sense, there's huge overlaps between the conditions. And hence also as well, the clinical profiles and how we manage uh, and treat the, uh, the conditions. So I apologize if I sort of interchangeably use the, the term Lewy body dementia, DOB, and also PDD throughout my talk. So let's just look at DOB first, one of the big problems, which I think is a, is a problem worldwide, and that is the underdiagnosis of, of, of DOB, and a lack of a systematic approach to management of this, and also, of course, uh, Parkinson's disease dementia. When you look at um, your pathology, 15 to 20% of dementia cases have evidence of Lewy body pathology. Yet when you move to uh, looking at anti-mortem diagnostic rates, the prevalence typically in research cohorts is around four to 7%. That's a lot lower than what one might expect from the autopsy studies. Uh, and what we don't know is what are the diagnostic rates in routine clinical practice. We know from Jim Galvin's work that there's a under recognition and also a more complex road to the diagnosis. And we furthermore, the quality of life for people who are living with Lewy body dementia, as well as their caregivers is often lower compared to the other dementias. There's also significantly higher uh, acute hospital resource usage in DOB compared to Alzheimer's and also uh, worse survival as well. So overall outcomes can be quite poor for DLB, unfortunately. Now I'm just gonna shift a little bit and look at the McKeith criteria for the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies and briefly mention this as this then relates into the, to the Diamond Lewy context. First of all, there's a number of core uh, clinical features which you're all probably very familiar with. The presence of motor Parkinsonism, complex visual hallucinations, cognitive fluctuations, REM sleep behavior disorder. And according to the consensus diagnostic criteria to make a diagnosis of probable DOB, you have two or more of the clinical features. If you are less certain, you can use the rubric of possible DOB, i.e. one core clinical feature. There's also a number of supportive clinical features which don't have the same specificity for DOB, but nonetheless raise the, the suspicion of the condition, whether that's neuroleptic sensitivity, autonomic dysfunction, or neuropsychiatric symptoms. Within the new consensus criteria, there are a number of biomarkers, uh, and these include the FP-SIT uh, DAT scan imaging to look at the nigrostriatal degeneration, as well as the MIBG cardiac scintigraphy to look at cardiac uh, sympathetic denervation. And furthermore, also polysonography that gold standard to diagnose REM sleep behavior disorder. Now, again, looking at the, the diagnostic groupings of either probable or possible DOB, the addition of the indicative biomarkers means that you can also make a diagnosis of probable DOB on the basis of the presence of an indicative biomarker plus just one of the clinical features. For possible DOB, you can have none of the clinical features, but you've got a positive uh, biomarker. But there's lots of problems with diagnosing DOB, and this is just some examples, there's many more. First of all, there's often challenges with regard to uh, insufficient neuropsychological evaluation. Taking a look at the example on the right-hand side here from an MMSE uh, between an Alzheimer's patient and a DOB patient, they may score comparably in terms of the, the global scores, but when one drills down to it, there is differences in terms of the subdomains. There's also often early atypical presentations in DOB. Patients who might present with a predominantly psychiatric profile rather than cognitive or uh, memory problems. 
There may also be the patient who presents with recurrent uh, unexplained delirium. There's also an underuse of the possible DOB diagnosis. There's difficulties in recognizing and defining cognitive fluctuations as clinicians. And certainly in certain uh, specialties, there's a, a lack of confidence in assessing motor symptoms. This is a big problem in the UK where a lot of our DOB patients are seen by psychogeriatricians or psychiatrists who are not so comfortable with the formal uh, motor assessment. There's also failures to ask about core and supportive clinical features, whether that's autonomic dysfunction, REM sleep behavior disorder, and osmia. On the PDD side, again, often due to the hustle and bustle of memory, uh, sorry, not memory clinics, movement disorders clinics, uh, there's often insufficient neuropsychological evaluation. Even if there is uh, appropriate cognitive assessments, there's inadequate assessment of the function of the client in relation to the cognition. And then it's quite difficult sometimes to separate is the function of the client related to motor uh, worsening or is it related to cognitive failures? We also know from the Diamond Louis work, which I'll present uh, subsequent to this, is that diagnosis is perhaps seen as less important than movement disorder service, given that there's a greater focus on the move, uh, motor uh, symptoms as opposed to the non motor. And we've also seen a reluctance to use the D word or dementia word uh, for people with Parkinson's disease. So this now segues into the Diamond Louis program, which was led by John O'Brien, who was initially at the University of Newcastle and has subsequently moved to, to Cambridge University. And the, the acronym breaks down as improving the diagnosis and management of neurodegenerative dementia of Louis body type, bit of a mouthful, hence we always use the, the phrase diamond. And the aim overall of this study was to bring together brief assessment and management toolkits and see if these can improve the diagnosis and management of DOB and also Parkinson's disease dementia, and also test whether these are fit for purpose um, in, our, in our real world clinical practice. The study ran from 2014 through to March uh, 2019. So this is just the overview of the study. It was uh, coordinated between the northeast of England and East Anglia, which is in the sort of southeast quadrant of, of the, the UK. And there was a number of interrelated work packages, which I'm going to go through uh, as, as, uh, as I talk. So looking firstly, sorry, I'm just moving my screen slightly, at the PPI element. This stands for public patient involvement. It's really important to say that this was a cross cutter across all of our work packages. And this really is, it was a key and integral element to actually the success of the Diamond Dewey program. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. We had a lay applicant involved in the beginning, writing the grant, uh, communicating with the grant uh, uh, provider, as well as also having uh, lay members and patient members of the study management group. This was supported by specific grant PIs, including Ian McKeith and Claire Bamford. And the PPI group was very active, meeting several times a year across the five-year program. And they provided advice on the study materials, the toolkit design, ordering of questions, priorities and management, conducting workshops, newsletter contents, uh, raising profile, thanking participants, looking at structure and content, uh, providing feedback. And so I have to say it was an incredibly potent uh, and important aspect to the, to the study. So let's look at just the first work package here, which we wanted to address, which was how is Lewy body dementia currently diagnosed in the UK and how is it managed? And this work was led up by John O'Brien and David Byrne. Uh, David Byrne, you may know of as a, 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 a movement disorder specialist based at Newcastle upon Tyne and is a world leader in the in the space of Parkinson's disease and also PSP. The John O'Brien, I should also say, is a uh, is probably well known to you as a, a world leading Lewy body dementia expert and old age psychiatrist. So the objectives of this work package were really to look at the diagnostic rates and care pathways for DOB versus non DOB dementia, as well as also Parkinson's disease dementia. And the methods involved a medical case note review across a number of different memory uh, services, movement disorder services, and neurology services in various uh, hospitals uh, within the UK. There was consecutive note review over an 18-month period, looking at 
for dementia diagnosis. This was titrated down then into individuals who had dementia and then further titrated down to DOV patients. And in those DOV patients, we actually approached them to consent for more detailed node examination with linked analysis of non-DOB subjects to really understand the pathways that the DOB patients had experienced in their routine clinical care. Now, I'm not going to present all of the findings with regard to the, the, the Diamond Louis. We're still analyzing a heck of a lot of the data at the moment, but I'll give you some of the headline messages which were provided from that. Looking just now at PDD, we carried out a, a similar process looking at case note review, looking specifically then for Parkinson's disease, and then within the Parkinson's disease cohort, if the diagnosis of uh, dementia was made, and again, a detailed notes analysis. So the headline, uh, what we came away with is that we found that overall between the Northeast of England and also East Anglia, that on average, 4.6% of dementia uh, subjects were diagnosed with DOB. There was a preponderance of males uh, amongst DOB subjects compared to non-DOB dementia cases. Uh, interestingly, we found that DOB prevalence was significantly higher in the Northeast of England uh, compared to East Anglia. When we drill right down to it, what there did seem to be was marked variation between different clinical services, which probably tunes back to individual clinicians and their, 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 their comfort and confidence in diagnosing DOB. We know specifically in the Northeast of England, because of the heritage and focus on Lewy body dementia over many years, you know, coming from Ian McKeith and colleagues, that this has created a penumbra of enthusiasm in DOB, which probably contributes to the higher levels of, of diagnosis of DOB within the Northeast of England. But it does show that there is marked variation. And I think, I'm sure if you were to interrogate services in the U US, you would see similar levels of variation. Other headline uh, results from this was that DOB as a proportion of all dementia was less common with advancing age. Whether this is a real effect or due to another factor, decreased recognition in younger patients, perhaps because of a more atypical profile or is just not su uh, suspected, is not clear. Or is there increased mortality with then censoring of the data? I mean, we're, we're still analyzing that to get a sort of further handle on that. Looking at the sort of variation in the, uh, the sort of between the, the regions, there was also a variation in diagnostic thresholds. The, the use of the possible DOB diagnosis was really quite uncommon. And cases in East Anglia to make a diagnosis of, of DOB, probable DOB, they expected many more core features. Conversely, they tended to do less imaging compared to the Northeast of England. So again, reflecting this variation in clinical practice for the diagnosis of DOB. So we've got a marked heterogeneity uh, between these two regions and between services and how DOB is, uh, is diagnosed. Similar to what Jim Galvin uh, found, the pathway to DOB diagnosis is not straight. Over half of our DOB patients had a prior diagnosis before they ended up with the, the diagnosis of DOB. The time taken to referral to DOB was longer than non-DOB dementias. And in this case, 376 days versus 177. Furthermore, the patients, despite the fact that there wasn't necessarily some of the indicative biomarker tests being done, there was a lot more structural imaging tests done in DOB patients before final diagnosis was made. So people were more uncertain about what was going on with these patients. Coming back to that point of the age effect, the younger the patient, the longer it took from the first uh, appointment to the diagnosis in the DOB group. DOBs have more clinical contacts, both prior to the diagnosis and then subsequent to the diagnosis, again, reflecting the complexity of the condition. Interestingly, looking at the previous diagnosis of MCI before the dementia diagnosis, that was a lot lower in DOB patients compared to non-DOB cases, suggesting that the MCA, MCI pathway is not necessarily the norm for DOB patients. Now looking at PDD, between the different regions, we diagnosed just under 10% of uh, Parkinson's patients with the dementia. There was no significant differences between the regions. 
Looking more broadly at the literature, this probably does represent and uh, underrepresent the, uh, the true prevalence of Parkinson's disease dementia, which we might expect more closely to be up around about 20-25% of Parkinson's patients, depending upon uh, the, the cohort and the service. So again, an under-recognition. Prior to the diagnosis of dementia being recorded in the Parkinson's patients, just under half had evidence of impaired activities of daily living due to cognitive impairment. 57% of the cases had cognitive impairment in multiple domains, and that had been present for at least two years. And just under 40% had evidence of both impairments in uh, activities of daily living and also cognitive impairment, i.e. features which would be consistent with uh, a diagnosis of PDD. We also noted that a significant proportion of PDD patients have received anti-dementia drugs before the uh, dementia diagnosis was made. So again, this chimes very much to the idea that the D word is not necessarily used in regard to Parkinson's patients. Okay, so just coming back to the Diamond Louis program and looking at the other work packages. The next one was very much more of a qualitative uh, question. What were the barriers and facilitators in terms of diagnosing and managing Lewy body dementia? And this work was led up by Claire Bamford, who is one of our leading qualitative uh, scientists. Now, again, there's a lot of work which has been done in this space, so I'm just going to very much summarize this. Uh, this in, the, the work package include observations in clinic, clinical interactions, clinical encounters, how clinicians transmitted the diagnosis, focus groups, interviews with professionals, also with uh, people with Lewy body dementia and their caregivers. Some of the sort of key messages which were coming out was that from the professionals, what's the point of making a Lewy body diagnosis unless the management differs? Their overall, and I think we've, we've spoken about this a little bit earlier, is that there's a real lack of awareness amongst professionals of Lewy body dementia and a lack of understanding that we need to make systematic inquiry of the symptoms or how we approach the management. Similarly, people with Lewy body dementia, their, their caregivers were very limited in their knowledge of Lewy body dementia. Many of them that had never heard of it. And I know certainly the LBDA always says that uh, uh, Lewy body dementia is the most common dementia you've never heard of. There is no idea to manage the common symptoms or to make linkages between the, the, the diverse symptoms that patients may experience, for example, constipation, urinary difficulties, reflecting that these are actually symptoms which are related to their Lewy body disease. They also reflected on challenges in maintaining social contact and activities and feeling very isolated, not knowing anybody else with the condition. And overall, there was a general sense from everyone that there was a fragmentation of care, fragmentation of services, no linkage between psychiatry, between uh, neurology, between movement disorders, geriatrics, and so forth. Okay, so I'm moving to one of the other work packages, which I suppose leads into the sort of the, this question, can we improve the diagnosis of Lewy body dementia? And this was work led by Alan Thomas, uh, a, a psychogeriatrician in Newcastle. And we developed a number of assessment toolkits for improving the diagnosis of Lewy body dementia as part of the program. And these have been published and are, are freely accessible. Uh, it was revised uh, more recently, these assessment toolkits in light of the new uh, McKeith uh, consensus criteria. If you want to find them, just type Diamond Lewy into your favorite search engine and you'll be able to access all the, uh, the resources. And I will keep uh, iterating this uh, as, as, as we go through. So I appreciate this may be a little small on your screens, but this is just an example of the assessment toolkit for, for DLB. You can see it is a very structured um, a, a toolkit, which can fit into you know, uh, paper-based notes or can be uh, converted into uh, for use in electronic medical records. And it's a very uh, much a simple tick box exercise looking at providing a structured way for the clinician to assess the different symptoms to then come to the conclusion of whether there is probable DLB or possible DLB. There's also one for Parkinson's disease dementia. And we also have a number of questionnaires which are looking at each of the, uh, the core symptoms. For example, here, cognitive fluctuations and REM sleep behavior disorder 
And these are based on validated questionnaires, which are used for these different symptom domains. And again, very simple structure of yes, no answers uh, for, for clinicians. And I think this lends itself quite nicely for people who are more be less experienced clinically, or people, uh, certainly in the UK, a lot of our dementia services are, are run by uh, nurses uh, and other, you know, other sort of allied healthcare professionals who may not be so familiar with some of the more uh, memory uh, clinic or neurological questions which need to be asked. In this context, we also have a structured uh, shortened version of the UPDRS for assessment of the motor symptoms. And as I say earlier, one of the challenges in the UK is that a lot of the dementia cases are also assessed by psychiatrists who are not so familiar with the, uh, the motor assessment. We've got all of this, as I say, on the, uh, the website. There's also training videos uh, for people to look at. Uh, and again, you know, we, we really want to spread the word on, uh, on this particular resource. I'm actually going to be, you know, for jobbing clinicians, is this going to actually uh, work for them? So we wanted to test the feasibility of this. Uh, and in one of our hospitals, we tried and tested the toolkit to see if it works. Um, we got feedback from clinicians and that led to some further refinements and tweaking of the, uh, the toolkit. So this was the final product. As I say, it's, it's available uh, online. And I also should say that we also have published on this uh, as part of a Lancet uh, Neurology Review article. I'm afraid to say that is not open access. Uh, we weren't allowed to, to, to make it open access, unfortunately. But if anybody wants a copy of this, just drop me an email and I'd be happy to send that to you. Okay, so moving to the, the next component of the Diamond Way program is really the trial component and asking, does actually, you know, we, we've done this fantastic toolkit, you know, does it actually make any real world difference? You know, we might say it's, it's a great thing to do, but, you know, can we get clinicians to take it up, use it, and actually uh, make a real world difference? And this, this was work between, sorry, myself, John O'Brien, and also uh, Ian McKeith, uh, who, as, as we know, is the, the, the paragon of, uh, of Lewy body uh, dementia research. The design of the study was uh, across uh, the northeast of England, a number of sites there, as also four sites in East Anglia, 18-month cluster uh, design pragmatic trial where services or hospital services were randomized to either have the, uh, the toolkit uh, training or to continue with current practice. Now, we couldn't force individuals, individual clinicians to use this. We just had to do an iterative training program with them. So, you know, that was, that's the sort of first important point uh, with regard to this. We've published on this. Um, again, this is another available article, Open Access. And just to summarize what, what was done as part of the trial, uh, the, the subjects and carers were assessed at baseline three months and six months. Assessments conducted by research staff external to the study, uh, unaware of what arm the subjects were in. We done a lot of the standard measures, uh, cognitive, neuropsychiatric, motor, global outcomes, both uh, clinician rated and also caregiver. Um, and we also asked caregivers, you know, how much burden were they experiencing? Were they suffering from any depression and so forth? Uh, and as part of the, uh, the UK element, we're, we're very interested in health economics and how much things cost. I'm sure it's uh, similar in the US. And that was also part of our, our study. And I'm, I'm not covering that today. You'll, you'll be pleased to know. This is just the uh, overall view of the trial. Uh, you can see that it's, it's not a huge trial. There's 75 was in the toolkit arm and 52 in the usual care. Uh, the demographics were broadly similar in each arm. Aside from maybe slight increase in terms of caregiver uh, burden and the Zaret in the, the, the usual care. So what was the, the findings? This is the, the, the clinician rated uh, uh, C, CGIC uh, uh, comparing the toolkit versus usual care. And I think the sort of message was very much that there was a tendency for less worsening in the toolkit arm compared to usual care. Uh, and this was also chimed uh, in the care rated global outcome as well. When we applied some statistics to this, this was uh, now looking at the clinician-related CGIC. Uh, it appeared to be preventing worsening with a, a, a trending effect, and this was significant in the uh, the care-rated global outcome. So I think that this is, you know, it's it's a small study uh, comparatively. 
you know, we, as I've emphasized, you know, we, we had no ability to force clinicians to use the, the toolkit in the day-to-day -day practice. So I have to say the fact that we were getting some form of signal was, was very pleasing to us. Um, and I think also one of the other interesting elements is that what we noted if the toolkit was introduced, that there did seem to be improvements for caregivers. They were a tendency for less depression, less burden as well. So I think we've got some tentative evidence that there may be real world benefits for the management toolkit. Okay, so I'm just gonna come back now to this um, idea of looking at the assessment toolkit and whether it has any real world benefit. At the same time of introducing the management toolkit, we also introduced the assessment toolkit as well to services. And then we conducted a repeat survey of all uh, consecutive notes uh, medical notes uh, that we'd assessed, you know, from the same services at baseline. Um, we looked at DOB and also Parkinson's disease in that context. And I'm just going to get straight to the sort of nub of the findings. Uh, and this is work which we're, we're hoping to publish quite soon, is that overall there was a suggestion certainly in uh, of the introduction of the assessment toolkits that this helped improve DOB diagnosis uh, uh, compared to what we'd initially seen. So I think that that's quite positive to say that maybe a systemized approach to diagnosis does help. We didn't see any changes in the PDD diagnostic rates. Although when we've begun to sort of drill down to this, uh, what seems to be is that the, the, certainly in the Northeast, there is no difference, although there is an improvement in the diagnosis of PDD in East Anglia. Part of that might reflect how services are, are set up, certainly in the Northeast of England with David Byrne's work and so forth. There's a strong recognition for making a diagnosis of PDD. So perhaps any gains from the assessment toolkit are going to be relatively more marginal. Whereas in East Anglia, what we have seen is quite a large increase in the diagnostic uh, rates, or certainly, uh, yeah, for, for PDD. So just to summarize things, uh, I think there's an under recognition, an under diagnosis that remains a significant challenge for both DOB and PDD. Diagnosis, sorry, not diagnosis, management is complex and difficult. We have produced, I hope, a number of diamonds to help with things, a structured assessment toolkit, uh, our toolkits, as well as a holistic structured management toolkit. Now, uh, coming back to my initial title, diamonds are forever, at least for a while. Uh, I think we, we are looking at something which is being produced quite recently, but we recognize that, you know, this is a, a, is a moving field. Excitingly, there's a lot more research which is coming out in the Lewy body dementia space, a lot more clinical trials. So I think we will have to continue to update and iteratively develop this so we can have the management toolkit from uh, 1.0 to 2.0 and beyond. And I think this is where, you know, uh, we have to move beyond just our work and actually engage others in this process. And, and you know, I think this leads into the next sort of uh, question, which is actually, can we get an international perspective and draw in, for example, the, you know, the fantastic infrastructure offered by the RCOEs, translating what is, you know, we've done in the UK to, to other centers such as, uh, you know, and, and, and Michigan. Of course, there's big challenges. We've done this, you know, from a UK standpoint, how do we translate across to the US? Although I, I certainly would argue that a DOB person who's uh, living in the Northeast of England is not going to be that different from uh, you know, a, a DOB case living in New York or, or Michigan. We do have to take the context that you know, uh, the, the toolkit that we've developed has got a UK basis. We've, uh, we obviously have based it around what our medication availability is, the constraints of our governance process. We have the National Institute for Health and uh, Care Excellence, which make various recommendations on, uh, on treatments. We are funded very differently in terms of our healthcare and also how we deliver healthcare is very different. As I've mentioned earlier, DOB is often primarily managed in the UK by psychogeriatricians as opposed to neurologists or, or geriatricians. But as, as I say, I think there is an opportunity here to, to take forward and you know, we wanna make sure that you know, this, this Diamond Louis resource becomes international with potentially modification and this was something which I presented at the Las Vegas uh, RCOE meeting uh, and, you know, one potential roadmap as how we might develop the Diamond Louis program for other centers. Potentially redrafting it in the context of, from a US perspective, involving the RCOEs, getting, you know, other expert ratification, 
trialing the guidelines potentially in selected centers and then making the guidelines fit for purpose uh, for you guys. But that's just, uh, you know, as I say, uh, an idea and I'd be very happy to hear sort of further thoughts on that. So I'm just going to wrap up there and just acknowledge that this was a, an enormous uh, team effort, uh, you know, and I, there's countless people who were involved in this particular study, but just to emphasize that, you know, uh, John O'Brien's leadership in this space has, has been absolutely excellent. Uh, and, you know, I did tell him that I was speaking today and he was very pleased to hear that we were going to be talking about Diamond Louie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, really appreciate uh, this lecture. I think that the whole idea behind the Carl Rennie Louis Body Dementia Initiative is to enhance awareness and understanding of DLB and related synucleinopathies. And what you've done today has, has, has clearly done that. And what you're doing as part of this really powerful consortium in, in the UK is really moving things forward in a fantastic way. Um, I have some, <clears throat> some uh, comments and questions, but I think we already have some in the chat space. So let me see what we have here. Um, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and uh, mute yourself and answer your question or ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I definitely can't answer it. But uh, thank you very much for your for your talk and, and for your time. We really appreciate it. A couple of questions. Uh, a, this is a really challenging um, uh, uh, study and topic to, 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 to go after. Um, Connor and Vickery in 2019 really did a, a, a sim, what I perceive to be a similar, a really intense intervention that was a, a nurse care led intervention on Parkinson's disease, um, where they really tried to in, improve quality of care in Parkinson's disease. And they did improve quality metrics. They, they increased time with the patient in phone calls and one measure of depression, but the, the, the major outcomes, um, motor function, quality of life and well-being did not have any impact. So how, how do you think that your intervention and your work uh, can compare with that? Is it something where we might increase metrics that we don't know if they're gonna actually meaningfully improve patient outcomes yet? I mean, I think that's a, that's a difficult question. Again, that might be the sort of the, uh, the vagaries of the different studies uh, just as a, as a natural process. One thing I would really sort of wanna emphasize here is, is that the management toolkit is not a, a more intense package of care. I think that's really important. We were very clear about that. This is about simply embedding good clinical practice on a day-to-day -day function. So just making sure people bear in mind to think, ask about constipation, ask about urinary difficulties, make sure you've covered those elements. We weren't looking to do anything you know, above and beyond that. It was just making sure that people did things that they should be doing really as part of the day-to-day -day practice. Um, you know, again, you know, whether, whether it's sort of a, you know, we, we, we didn't really see that quality of life. We, I mean, we did see improvements as it were in the caregivers. Uh, and I suppose the other element is that when looking at the global outcomes, which I suppose is a, is a proxy for that quality of life, we did see a uh, less of a worsening. And I think this probably reflects the fact that a lot of our treatments are more about symptomatic management. So if you know, a good outcome for us is potentially limiting the worsening. We may not be able to get people better, but we certainly can hold them uh, at the, the, the present state that they're at. Uh, I'm sure that's not really answering your question uh, per se, because I, I think that you know, I, I would certainly say that the work we've done, you know, whilst it's a large DLB PDD study, in the grand scheme of things, it's a small study. You know, I think we need to do more to actually see, is this a genuine signal? But I think you know, doing, doing what you should be doing anyway well, I think does seem to make, make a difference. We, we, we just wanna shift that sort of average you know, of what people do to just slightly, slightly better and hopefully that will have a sort of population effect. Thank you. Uh, Vikas Kodigal, why don't you ask your questions? Sure. Um, great. Thank you for a great talk. I had a question about your um, your management toolkit and whether it could be altered or optimized uh, to make it more of a caregiver focused or patient focused toolkit where much management occurs um, in between physician visits. Yeah, that's actually I was chatting with Hank about this just before we need 
we've been having conversations, uh, you know, which just came before COVID and then COVID hit. Uh, actually, really looking, can we develop something which is much more caregiver oriented and which is actually based in that space? And we we've got an infrastructure in the UK which is uh, called Ad Admiral Nurses, and we now have a number of Admiral Nurses who have got Lewy body training and. They, they provide actually, uh, they're, they're not necessarily uh, geographically located where the patients are. They provide a telephone advice service. And, uh, and I think it's similar to we've got the Parkinson's disease uh, UK charity, which also do similar. And what, what that has sort of provided is a, a very useful way to help uh, improve people's awareness of the different symptoms, get advice, also helping them perhaps structure their or subsequent, uh, you know, meeting with the clinician of what they want to ask and what they want to get from it. Um, but we really, yeah, we we did wonder if we need to actually, as part of our, you know, uh, Diamond Louis 2.0, actually begin to do a, a lot more work in that space. We wanted to concentrate on the healthcare professionals first, but you know, this is sort of something we we think is 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 a missing element, as it were. So I think it's a very good point, and you know, again. If we get money, then maybe we might be able to do a little bit more in this space. That's that's always the challenge. Dr. Taylor, you mentioned that the D word seems to be underused or under recognized in PDD. Um, it, it, do you think that's a problem that expands beyond the UK uh, that uh, elsewhere? And I guess a related question is, you mentioned that the the even despite the fact that people identified impairment in activities of daily living due to cognitive impairment, I'm wondering whether the clinicians are saying, well, they're impaired, but actually I'm putting on the motor as opposed to the cognitive. Um, is that the basis for the underutilization of the word D, uh, the D yeah, word in, in PTD? I, I mean, it's, and again, you know, uh, there'll be much more experienced people who are, who are on this um, Zoom call uh, today, you know, within the sort of the, 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 the Parkinson space and, you know, interacting with MDS. And certainly MDS is, you know, uh, I, I think it's beginning to really champion the non-motor elements of Parkinson's disease with that increased recognition. And I think positively that is having an effect that we need to be looking at cognition. I think the, the D word carries, uh, you know, for some people, a lot of, you know, negative connotations. And I know this has been sort of a challenge in certain jurisdictions, you know, should we be using uh, dementia? Should we, you know, using major neurocognitive impairment or, you know, other euphemisms? And it has oscillated backwards and forwards of what, what is appropriate. I mean, I personally, I, I, don't, I don't care. Uh, what I care about is that the person gets the right uh, treatment and management, you know, so, you know, if what we find in the UK perspective, putting that uh, dementia element offers up that other opportunity in terms of the, you know, the social care, accessing certain resources, uh, you know, financial uh, support, etc. So that's where we've, we've really sort of tried to push as well that we need to be making sure that we are including that uh, for, for individuals. Um, so I mean, I, I guess from a U.S. perspective, it is also highly important that you, that you also do that as well. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? I don't see any more in the chat space, but we have some time and certainly. I had a follow-up uh, question. This is Kevin Kerber again. It also, at my second question there was about, um, you know, the, the system in English, which I, I, in England, which I perceive has a much more robust way to implement evidence-based interventions, NICE and other agencies um, that I, I, I perceive do a really great job identifying value and care and finding ways to promote it. So, which seems like, you know, what you're targeting. So do you engage them and, and how do those engagements go and, and how do you, how do you uh, use the resources that England has? Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, I, I suppose I am quite proud of our system. We are, uh, a, a, you know, with our NHS, a relatively, um, you know, unified structure and network. And that means that, you know, what is, you know, what is top down directed, for example, from NICE can be implemented right across the NHS. Uh, John O'Brien, uh, very handily, has uh, been uh, involved in the dementia uh Dementia guidelines via NICE. Um, unfortunately, with the, the Diamond Louis uh, the guidelines, we, we came out a little bit after the most recent iteration from NICE. Uh, but I think for the next version of NICE, we're certainly going to be uh, 
part and parcel of that. So we do have very close communication and certainly the work that we've done, uh, which was, was funded by our, our, our sort of gov governmental NIHR, very much feeds into to NICE. NICE will look at the evidence that NIHR is generating from its research programs into, into their recommendations. So we, we will have that opportunity to, to say, you know, this is the best practice that we want to be going forward for Lewy body dementia. Other questions for Dr. Taylor? Thank you. Thanks. Well, if not, then I want to thank you once again for coming all this way to uh, join us uh, for this uh, Carl Rennie Dementia, Blue Body Dementia Initiative fifth annual lectureship. Uh, I think we learned a lot and I hope that many people access the forms that are available through the Diamond Louis site. I know that I have, and I think they're very useful. So we appreciate your time and we're getting you out early enough so you can pick up your son before too late. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And, and wonderful to meet all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.